morning and welcome to Sherwood New Life Online. We're glad you're here with us. My name is Adam. I'm the youth leader here at Sherwood. And I'm happy that you're, you were able to join us this week online. We Everybody is online this week. We're not meeting in person. Um, the Purcell family is still uh, fighting COVID and stuff like that. So, you know, we want to just take an extra week off, take off stress and just make sure everything's been quarantined and cleaned down and all that stuff. Um, and just to make sure everybody's safe and good to go. So they would, I know they do cover your prayers, so please continue to pray for them. They're doing well, they're coming through it, but um, I know that they would love uh, your prayers and continued thoughts. So um, with that being said, let's pray this morning before we get into our, our word. God, I just thank you for an opportunity to come together and um, hear, hear from your heart this morning. God, I pray that the words that I have this morning would be from you, that they would uh, touch the lives of the people who are hearing this, whether it's for the first time or, or t with us on Sunday morning live or um, further on down the road as, as we go. God, and just thank you for an opportunity to speak your word and your truth and in your name. Amen. So last week, Pastor Terry, or two weeks ago, Pastor Terry started our September Psalm series. Uh, last week, she spoke on Psalms 23. This week, I want to go back to the beginning of the book of Psalms, uh, which again is in the middle of your Bible. Um, but go back to the, that first chapter. And um, Pastor Terry, as she said, there, there's different kinds of Psalms that we see in, in the Bible. Uh, and, and in this book, it's a collection of songs and different things. But some of them are, um, you know, there, there's different categories that we would place it into. And this would be one that we would place into the, the wisdom uh, wisdom category. So John Calvin, he actually calls the Psalms the the anatomy as of the soul, um, and he calls it this because they show us the inner workings of the of the image bearers of God, those who are following after God, and, and those that would be uh, it shows us joy, despair, confusion, anger, fear, and calm. Um, Charles Spurgeon, when he's referring specifically to chapter one, uh, the first Psalm, he says, this is the preface for the entire book of Psalms and shows us the way to blessedness. Now, um, some translations will say happy, others will say blessed, but I think it really gets summed up in that term joy because you can, you can be joyful, you can be blessed without being happy. Happy is more of an emotion. So I think blessed is a, is a bit better of a word, but I think it still fits into that concept of joy that Calvin was talking about. Um, psalm 1 is often called the psalm of the two ways, and it refers to the two ways that a person can live their life. So let's go ahead. Um, hopefully you've had time to get to Psalm chapter 1, and I'm going to go ahead and read that. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV, which is sl slightly more on the paraphrase side than uh, what we would normally use, which would be the NASB. But I liked the way that this kind of worded it a couple of words. It's a little easier to um, preach from. So it says, Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who's, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So these verses are, are they're contrasting the believer from the unbeliever. The things that the believer does that the unbeliever doesn't do, or, the, or you know, back and forth between this is what the wicked person does. The, the believer is not going to take part in that. And so, um, you know, we, we, they're talking about, as we look at verse two, it says, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. It's talking about the Bible, you know, the word of God, uh, the joyful, uh, ble the blessed person delights in the word of God, um, which, and, and if we go back to that verse two and go down to the second half of it, it says, um, and who meditates on it day and night, who meditates on the law day and night. Now, meditation is something that, um, as I've been going through some of the, the spiritual disciplines, that's one of those ones that we'd be talking about that will come up in that series down the road. Um, this meditation is different than you might think of when we think of meditation in terms of like Eastern mythology and stuff like that. It's not the complete clearing of your mind, allowing your mind to go blank and doing all that stuff. It, it, it's more of a repeated reflection on, on what God is saying on a scripture. Um, 
if you look at that, the word meditation in the Hebrew, in Hebrew, there's two different um, definitions. And so the one that this is uh, referring to is to be taken up or absorbed with something. Um, and meditation, ultimately, what it does is that it allows the word of God to penetrate our lives. It, it The Bible isn't meant to be... Um, it's not just meant to be a source of information, but it's meant to be a source of transformation because this is the word, this is God speaking to us. We talked about that when I did the Bible intake series. This is God speaking to us. So it's not just information, it's transformation as well. Um, the, another theologian, J.I. Packer, he talks about it this way. He says, meditation is the activity of calling to mind and thinking over and dwelling on and applying to oneself the various thing that one knows about the works and ways and purposes and promises from God. It's an activity of holy thought consciously performed in the presence of God under the eye of God by the help of God as a means of communion with God. As verse 3 says, it anchors us like a tree next to the streams of, of life, to flowing streams. In other words, it anchors us to the source of life, God's heart and his desires for us, his, his promises for us, his purpose for us. Delighting in the word of God allows us to draw closer to him um, and to be transformed and to bear fruit. Um, whatever he does prospers, as we see at the end of that verse three, it says, because it says the person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields in its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prosper. Now, I know um, this can sometimes people will use this verse as, as part of the prosperity doctrine and prosperity gospel. Uh, and I want to say this is not talking about that, because if we look at these and if we kind of take it into context, um, you know, uh, what we're seeing here is that the prosperity is in regards to the fruit that they're they're bearing on that tree. Um, so this isn't an earthly prosperity necessarily. It's a, it's a prosperity in the purpose that God has called you to do. Um, the purpose that he's put on your life and the, and the place that he's called you to bear fruit. If we're match step with him going to the word, word of God, um, putting that consistently into our hearts and into our lives, meditating on it, becoming more and more like God, becoming more and more after the heart of God, that prosperity, the things that whatever we do prosper becomes the things that God has in purpose for us to do. Um, you know, this Psalm is kind of setting up the, the rest of the book of Psalms. Um, and we see a lot of crossovers in, in this uh, between the, the the comparison between the wicked and the believer and the different things that they do. But uh, one of the ones that I want to highlight is is uh, chapter 37, verse 4, and it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's a, a very popular psalm, and a lot of us people, a lot of us tend to think, um, okay, if, if I delight myself in the Lord, God's going to give me what I want. But that's, that's not really what it's saying. What it's saying is that... Um, you know, it's it's not this this idea of God as a cosmic vending machine. What it really is, it's that we delight in Him, in His Word, and as we do that, our hearts become more and more transformed to be like His heart. Um, we begin to desire the things of God's heart. His desires become our desires, and He shows us what to desire. So contrast this with the next verse in what we see the results of not following God. Um, the wicked are like chaff, and what chaff is, that's that's the husks uh, from as they would gather the wheat, and they would begin to... to um, you know, turn it into something useful. The chaff was the husks that were useless. They were just thrown away. It was the things that they allowed to just blow off in the wind. And so um, they're useless and discarded after the harvest. And um, what's interesting is that the, the Hebrew word here that is used for wicked describes um, uh, people who do not belong to God and are controlled by their, their passions. They are totally depraved. Every part of their being is tainted by sin. And because of this, they are incapable of doing anything that has eternal value in God's sight. So what, what this is basically saying is that in our own humanity, we're incapable of doing anything that's truly good. Um, because anything good that we do is really born out of our own selfishness. It's, our, it's born out of our own desires. 
Um, and so even if it's a good thing, it's still not really good because it, it's, it's our selfishness that's showing through it. So verse 6, however, though, um, as we draw close to God, we see the path of, of righteousness. Um, says, for the Lord watches over the way of righteousness, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So um, what we're seeing here is that, that uh, the, ult the wicked ultimately perish as they cannot reach that source of life. They're not planted like that tree next to the stream of life. They're not planted in God's word, being able to, to know his heart, being transformed like his heart. And so because they aren't there planted by that stream of life, they're not connected to that life-giving water, ultimately they'll, they'll, they'll be destroyed and they will um, be led to destruction. They aren't transformed by God. Now, and when we draw close to God, our deeds, which by the way, our deeds don't get us to heaven. It's your deeds don't save you. Good works don't save you. Um, they, they become fruit. Our good deeds become fruit that brings other people into the kingdom of God. And so we give, we do these good things and we give because he first gave to us. Um, our good deeds become, rather than being an extension of our selfishness, because we're doing good deeds in the name of God, because of who God is and his desires and his heart, they become, uh, rather than, than uh, an extension of our selfishness, they become an extension of our thankfulness. And so, I mean, you can see this if you go to John three sixteen. it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his uh, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God knew that we were depraved. He knew that we there was nothing that we could do on our own in order to be able to 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 save ourselves and get us back to that um, communion with God. And so, as Jesus, God gave up His life for us. So God said, "There's nothing you can do. All, even your good works are just part of our, our selfishness on your own part. And because you can't do that." Because you aren't holy, because you aren't righteous like me, I will send my son down as Jesus Christ and he will die on the cross and give, give his life for you. So in believing in Jesus, in trusting in him, we are then declared righteousness, uh, declared righteous. It's, it's justification uh, based on Jesus' righteousness. It's not something we deserve. It's a gift. It's grace. That as we, if you go back to our study on Galatians, it's, it's all about grace. It's God did this because we couldn't. And so as we, we become transformed, as we meditate on the scriptures, as we meditate on the, the things that God has for us, we become transformed in our lives to the point where now our, our, our good works and our good deeds are now just pointing others towards Jesus. It's not about us anymore. It's about him and what God wants and God's purpose for us. And his purpose is ultimately that none should perish. And that's why he sent Jesus is, is because he doesn't want us to perish. He wants to be with us in a relationship. It's not about rules and and all that stuff. It's it's about having that relationship. And a lot of the rule, the things we see as rules is because those things aren't good for us. They're not good for building that relationship. Just like with a relationship with a spouse or a parent or a kid, if you're doing things against them that are going to pull you away, those aren't good things. And, and so we set up boundaries for ourselves in our lives so that we can hold on to those relationships. And it's the same way with God. We, we do these things out of thankfulness, out of gratitude, not because we think they're going to earn our way to heaven, but because we are thankful for what he did for us. The book of Psalms not only shows us that we need to draw close to God, but that our path will not always be easy. See, the David, who writes a lot of the Psalms, we see, if you go back in, into the, to the Bible and look at the stories of David and the things that he does, the Bible actually shows him as some of the, doing some pretty stupid stuff. He's an adulterer. He has the guy who he uh, stole his wife, execute, sent to the front lines to be killed in a battle and stuff so that he wouldn't be caught. David stumbled and fell off the path of righteousness but what, what the difference is and why he was still called a man after God's heart was that he would repeatedly, he, he would repent and he would turn away from that and he would go back to God and, and make things right. And so for us, that's what we have to do is, is we have to realize that we are going to stumble 
at times. But all it takes is going back to and saying, okay, God, I know I've stumbled. And coming back and saying, God, I, I want to walk on your path. This scripture is an encouragement that if we continue to re, uh, reset our eyes on God and delight in his word, he will transform us and make us new. Um, you know, salvation is in, an instant thing. The minute that you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you commit to follow him, you are counted as one of the righteous. And if you want to do that today, I encourage you. All, all it simply takes is, is just saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to follow after you. I want to become a lifelong disciple. I want to become a lifelong follower of you and declare him as your Lord. And that's all it is. I mean, we, we have some prayers and stuff that we'll say um, to help us out with that. And, you know, as, as a group that we would do. Um, but there's nothing magic about the prayers that we do. It's that simple act of saying, God, I'm going to put my faith in you. I'm going to trust in you and I'm going to follow you and making him Lord of your life. And once we do that, that salvation is instant. We are instantly uh, declared justified. Now, we're not perfect in that moment because the other side of that um, that righteousness is is not salvation, but sanctification. And sanctification is a journey. Um, and so today, if, if you want to be, to um, put your faith in Jesus, I would encourage you, just say those simple words. Jesus, I love you. I want to follow you. And then please let us know. Get in contact with us through our website, SherwoodNewLife.org. Let us know that so that we can help you on your next steps and, and help you connect, whether it's to our church here, if you're local, or to another group that's around, or, or to another local church that's near you. We would love to be able to do that, and we'd love to, be, uh, to begin praying with you. Um, and for those of us who maybe we gave our lives to Jesus, Jesus a while ago and we're sitting here going, man, I feel like I've fallen down. Just remember, sanctification is a journey. It, it's, it's a journey that we walk our whole lives to become what God has declared us through Jesus, which is righteous. Uh, God declared us that. It's final. And that process takes time. We're not perfect the moment we, we accept Jesus. It's a process throughout our whole lives. It's a journey that walks the way of the righteous. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you that you gave us an opportunity to follow after you. And God, that we have moments where, and where we can just sit and listen and be still with you. And God, that we have passages like the Psalms that we can repeat and scriptures that we can repeat over and over and over to get them into our heart, God, to where as we study these things, as we look deeper into these things, as we follow and stick to your word and read your word, God, that we become more and more like you, God. And I would pray that for, for our church, um, our local church, but the church as a whole, God, that we would get back to um, that spiritual discipline of meditation, that thinking on your word, so that we become not just informed by the Bible, but transformed by it, God, and that our hearts would become more and more like yours, God, that we would be a people that that the community would look around us, that we would be a person that would say, hey, they're a person after God's heart. They're, they, they are what I want to be. I want to know the God that has transformed them, and I want to, I want to follow after them, and I want to be part of that as well. God, we, we thank you, and we, we continue to pray for those um, overseas that, that are being persecuted right now, God. We pray for the, the people in Haiti who are dealing with the aftermath of a natural disaster. God, we pray for the Christians in places that we can't even say they are, but that are doing your kingdom because they've accepted your calling and are seeking after your heart and are living that purpose that you have for their lives, Father God. I pray that you would help us to walk that path of righteousness as we go forward today and in your name. Amen. Thank you again for being here with us. Remember, continue to pray. If you'd like to give, you can do so online. We'd love for you if this is your first time or if you haven't done so yet and you've been watching us for a little while, go to our website, SherwoodNewLife.org. Click the connect button and just fill out that connect form with us. That lets us know, one, that you're watching and that uh, that we can we have people that we can reach out to. But we'd also love to know how to reach out. There's, there's prayer request forms on there. Um, you can let us know from that same form if you accepted Jesus for the first time today. Um, and we'd just love to connect with you. 
Again, that's SherwoodNewLife.org. You, if you're a member here, you can go there to update your information in case you move, different things like that, and help us keep in contact with you. Again, have a great week. We'll see you next time.